Newton's laws of motion gonna be the topic of this lesson. We're really making a big transition here and talking from like kinematics and talking about motion to now talking about mechanics and kind of the sources of that motion or at least the sources in the change in that motion as we'll see. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. All right, so Newton's laws really kind of tell us the role that forces play in the universe and how they alter the motion of objects. But before we can talk about the role for forces in the universe, we gotta talk about what in the world a force even is. And simply put, a force is just a push or a pull uh, on one object by another. That's the root definition. And there's really come in, in two different classes. And the first we call a contact force. And it's where the nature of that push or the pull uh, is just due to the fact that two objects are in contact with one another. So if you think of like one car rear-ending another one in an automobile accident, so that the nature of that force that the one car exerts on the other is due to the fact that they were in contact during the accident. The alternative is what we call a field force. And this is where the nature of the force, it is not mediated through physical contact whatsoever. So, and gravity is typically presented in this context as being a classic example of one of these field forces. So, and you can think of gravity like as you or I experience it on the earth, and you might be like, well, I'm in contact with the earth right now, so how's that a field force, Chad? Well, again, the nature of that force is not at, you know, the result of being in contact. You know, jump out of an airplane or jump off a tall building and you'll find out that gravity is still a force that is operating on you when you're not in physical contact. It is a field force. And this is why we can talk about like gravitational fields and things of this sort. If you think about the, the Earth and the Sun being 93 million miles apart, and yet there's still this attractive force of gravity operating, even though they are very far from being in physical contact. And again, that's what we mean by a field force. So uh, either a contact force or a field force. And what we'll find out is that even the contact forces all come down to being uh, the result of some field force, uh, as we'll see. So it turns out there are four fundamental forces, and they are all field forces. Every force that you're gonna encounter anywhere along the way in your life is gonna get reduced down to one or more of these what we call four fundamental forces. So, and you should understand a few characteristics of these four fundamental forces uh, and kind of relative strengths amongst the four as well. But what you're gonna find out is that in our typical physics curriculum in one year one here, we're gonna focus only on the electromagnetic force and that's gonna be a big part of the second semester topics. Uh, and then on the gravity here, and that's gonna be a big part of the first semester topics. But the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force, we are largely not going to talk about except for the next couple of minutes. Now, if you take a look, so these are listed in order of uh, decreasing strength. So the strength increases as we go from bottom to top here. And you wanna definitely know these relative strengths here. So the strong nuclear force is the strongest of the four fundamental forces. Gravity is the weakest of the four fundamental forces. And once again, these are all field forces. They are not contact forces. All right, if you take a look really quickly at the strong nuclear force, this is what holds a nucleus together. If you take a look at, uh, say, the protons and neutrons in a nucleus, and the neutrons aren't usually an issue, but you might be like, well, why do the protons hang out together in the nucleus? Aren't they both positively charged and repel each other? Yes, they do. But the repulsive force, that's just the electromagnetic force. The stronger force that holds them together is the strong nuclear force. Notice it's higher on the list in terms of relative strength. Now it turns out though that it only operates at very, very small distances. Distances akin to the size of the nucleus. And so inside the nucleus, so protons can experience that strong nuclear force, but at any distances further away, it turns out that strong nuclear force, strong nuclear force decays to zero very quickly. So only operates at very short distances. Next on the list is this electromagnetic force and something you're gonna be maybe a little bit familiar with. We like to say that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So, and it turns out there's another half to it though. That's the electric side. The magnetic side of it though is, uh, we'll study this again in second semester, is only experienced by moving charges. So static charges as well as moving charges can experience electric forces, but moving charges alone will experience the magnetic side of it. But it turns out they're really just different representations of one unified force between them, the electromagnetic force. Uh, but this operates over much larger distances than the strong nuclear force. Uh, and in fact, it, it decreases as you get further and further away, but in fact, the, the, the distance over which they operate is effectively infinite. 
All right, the weak nuclear force. So this one is probably something you've never encountered and likely never will encounter again, unless you take some sort of advanced particle physics class. Uh, but the weak nuclear force is something that's only really encountered as part of like nuclear decay events, like beta decay, or uh, it turns out nuclear fusion in stars is initiated uh, as a result of the weak nuclear force. It's mediated through particles like mesons and fermions and things of this sort, but not something you're going to study in, in any great detail. In fact, I've never studied it in any great detail either, and we're definitely not going to study it as part of the curriculum throughout this year either. But the other big thing you should know is that one, it's associated with nuclear decay events, but two, uh, it also only operates at very, very short distances. It turns out even shorter than maybe even the strong nuclear force, so like 10 to the negative 17 meters or something like this. So again, uh, outside of a nucleus, it's just not a force that has any appreciable magnitude whatsoever. And so out in the macro world, outside of the nucleus, we don't really see the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force. Really, all the forces that we're going to study this year are going to be the result of either the electromagnetic force or gravity or some combination thereof. And finally, gravity is the last of these forces. Uh, it is the weakest of the four, so, but also the distance over which it can operate is effectively infinite. And just like the electromagnetic force, uh, the further two objects get away, the lower that gravitational force will be, but effectively it can operate over infinite distances. So now that we know what a force is, we're ready for Newton's laws of motion, which again are going to kind of describe the role that forces play in the universe. Now, there are three laws here, Newton's first, second, and third laws, and you've got to kind of know what they are by number as well. So if I say Newton's first law, you should be thinking, oh, that's the law of inertia, and it's uh, if there's no net force acting on an object, it will continue in the motion that it has, or something of that sort. So, but we're going to put a little more technical definition on there, and it's going to say that uh, if there's no net force acting on an object, then its velocity will remain constant. We can kind of make a, an if-then statement that's kind of a little bit of an equation here. So if the sum of the forces or the net force acting on an object is zero, then the velocity is going to remain constant. So some people say objects in motion tend to stay in motion is one way to, to phrase this. Again, objects in motion that have no net force acting on them tend to stay in motion. So, but here's the deal. So if there's no net force acting on an object, either if it's not moving, it will stay not moving. Or if it's moving off in a certain direction with a certain speed, it will continue in that direction with that speed. So uh, let's say I took a, a baseball and I threw a baseball. Well, we expect that baseball to kind of arc and finally hit the ground and slow down along the way due to air resistance. But gravity is a force that's operating on it. Air resistance is a force that's operating on it. And because there are forces operating on it, it does not get to continue in that same motion. So the velocity is not going to remain constant. But let's say I was on some spacecraft out in deep space, not near any planetary bodies that can exert any sort of gravitational force. And I threw that same baseball off into deep space. Well, in deep space, there's no air, so there's no air resistance. And we said we're not near any planetary body, so there's no real gravity. And so all of a sudden, that baseball is just going to continue on a straight line. And once it leaves my fingertips, it's going to have a constant velocity until it encounters a force. So maybe, it, you know, maybe thousands or millions of years down the road, it gets near a black hole or a star or something and experiences gravity or something like that. But outside of that, it's just going to continue on. So with a constant velocity, because there's no net force acting on it. That is the first law. And we also call it the law of inertia. And, and it kind of also talks about a role that mass plays in all this as well. And so uh, mass is really a resistance to a change in motion. The greater the mass, the greater the resistance to the change in motion. So for example, let's say I told you that somebody was coming at me at 30 miles an hour and I stopped them with my hand. Just put my hand up, I stopped them. Would you be impressed? So would you be less impressed if I told you when I said somebody, I meant a mosquito and I put my hand up and I stopped their motion. So no, not super impressed here because uh, a mosquito has a very small amount of mass and so it doesn't take very much force to alter its motion. Now on the other hand, what if I'd said it was a semi truck that was coming at me and I put up my hand and it was going 30 miles an hour and I stopped it. Well now you should not be impressed either because I'm just a liar. That thing totally steamrolled me. But that much larger mass of a semi truck would take a much larger force to alter its motion. So again, mass is really a measure of the resistance to a change in motion. And that's a good segue to talk about now Newton's second law. This is probably the most important of the three laws because we're going to encounter it the most often. Often. So it's a nice little lovely equation as well. So the sum of the forces or net force acting on an object is equal to mass times acceleration. 
So if you recall that acceleration is change in velocity over change in time. So by having an acceleration, it's indicative that there's a change in the motion, a change in the velocity. So keep that in mind. So now that we have a net force that's not zero, then we're gonna have an acceleration and they're directly proportional. If you doubled the force acting on a, a, an object with a particular mass, it would also double the acceleration as well. So, but also mass and acceleration are inversely proportional. If you applied the same net force to two different objects, where one was much larger than the other. Well, the one with a larger mass would experience then a smaller acceleration for this equality to hold true. So force and acceleration are directly proportional, but mass and acceleration for a given force are inversely proportional. But this is Newton's second law, and it turns out this is gonna kinda of be the foundation for much of the calculations we do over the next couple of semesters involving forces. All right, finally, oh, one other thing I want to talk about here. So uh, force, the SI unit is the Newton. It is a derived SI unit, so capital N uh, abbreviated here. But we can use Newton's second law to figure out what in the world a Newton is expressed in base SI units. Well, it's mass times acceleration. So mass, the SI unit, is the kilogram. Acceleration, so SI unit is the meters per second per second, or meters per second squared as the case may be. So, and if force is measured in newtons, and it's equal to mass of acceleration, well then a newton must be a kilogram meter per second squared. And this is how we're gonna do some dimensional analysis over the course of the semester. When we introduce some new physics quantity, we're gonna introduce its SI units as well, and oftentimes we'll derive some sort of expression for it in terms of the base SI units. All right, so let's move on to Newton's third law here. And so sometimes you'll hear this said like, uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So we're gonna get a little more specific. For every force, there's an equal and opposite force. And we can say this with a little equation as well. So the force of one object acting on a second object is equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction to the force of the second object acting on the first object. Now I said equal in magnitude, so there's an equality here, but opposite in direction, and the way we account for that is put a negative sign in front there. That accounts for that opposite direction. So, but again, for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. So if you go to punch me in the face, you're gonna be applying a force to my face from your fist, but what you don't realize is that I would actually be applying a force on your fist with my face. So I used to know somebody that the, they used a phrase, something that kind of run into my fist repeatedly. Um, it's kind of their way of saying, let's fight, or, or something like that in kind of a joking fashion. So, but, but it belies the fact that for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. Because again, when you punch me in the face, yes, you are exerting a force on my face, but we don't think that there's also a force being exerted back on the fist. Because what if you go to punch me and I dodge and your fist goes right by, continues its motion right by my face. Whereas by hitting my face, your motion's gonna slow down considerably and ultimately come to a stop maybe. So because of the force that's equal in magnitude but opposite in direction that my face is applying back on your fist. So another example, gravity. We like to think of gravity as the earth is pulling me down. So, and for those of us that are geocentric, earth-centered, that's the way to look at it, right? But I prefer to think of it as I'm pulling up on the earth with an equal force but opposite in direction. So equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So, and it's true. So the earth is pulling down on me with gravity, but I'm pulling back on up, up on it with gravity as well. Gravity works both ways. Two objects that have mass are both attracting each other, it turns out. Now you might look back and see like, oh, but even though it's the same force, because I have a much smaller mass, I will experience a much larger acceleration uh, as a result of this attraction between me and the earth. All right, so those are Newton's three laws. And again, you've got to know them by number. So, and in the next lesson, we're going to start again, especially applying the second one uh, and start doing some of the classic physics mechanics calculations. We're going to introduce gravity. We're going to introduce the normal force and we're going to introduce friction and then start setting up some free body diagrams, things of the sort. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, then you might consider giving it a like. Happy studying.